Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode here in our Max Colonization Dumpster Fire. That's right, we have seven broken Atmosuit docks, and this is the reason why. Our entire oxygen system is sort of broken down and is just supplying nothing but polluted oxygen. It's utterly and shamefully as dorked up as a football bat. How did this happen, you ask? Besides me being a colossal nub, it had to do with our shipping system. I am sure there's footage somewhere in one of these episodes that shows us setting up a new glass forge system. The glass forge takes in its sand, throws in its conveyor receptacle, where the auto sweeper automatically loads the sand into the glass forge and creates glass forever. Well, at least until this smart storage bin says, hey, we're done, we have 12 tons, in which it'll fire off a green signal, which will then turn this glass forge off. Well, you may remember that in the past few episodes, I've made a bunch of window tiles out of Yes, glass. We've also expanded our solar panels, which takes even more glass. And since the new Sweet Dreams update launched today, I wanted to make our very first real bona fide kitchen, at least by Ani standards. So we threw in one of these spice grinders, and voila, we now have a kitchen that we could actually make some spices in. As a quick aside, I don't know how many spices we're actually going to be making in this colony, because the juice doesn't seem to be worth the squeeze. But in order to make this kitchen look the way it's supposed to, at a minimum I had to add more pixel packs, which of course takes even more glass. So while normally this line is backed up because we don't have to create glass too often, this time we've been using a little bit too much glass too quickly, which has been crushing our sand delivery going over to our oxygen system. We've prevented this mistake in the future by adding a conveyor bridge. All the sand gets loaded up in this conveyor loader and then dumped onto this rail. And it used to go just a standard 50-50 split because this line was pretty much backed up always so it really didn't matter. Well, when that glass forge was eating all that sand, only 50% of the sand was heading towards the oxygen center and the other 50% we're going to the glass forge. But like I said, the conveyor bridge fixes this because now this side of the rail has priority, which means our oxygen system has priority. Unfortunately, the damage is already done and all of these Atmosuit socks have been breaking. And since they're being supplied with a bunch of polluted oxygen, they're not actually filling, which means we can't get to these rock crushers often enough to be able to create more sand. And without more sand, the deodorizers aren't creating the clay, which means none of the clay is being dropped off so it can be used to create more ceramic, which then of course brings us back to the circle of life that ceramics use to create more sand. I did just notice this and wondering why it's not offloading. It's probably something to do with the way it's feeding directly onto this bridge exit, although this one's working just fine. But we can see here there's a ton of clay waiting to be used. Actually, I just figured it out. This conveyor loader has been disabled by the automation grid because there's an errant automation wire sitting right there, which is telling this conveyor loader not to get rid of any of its materials. We'll let the dupes get in there, sort that out, and at least it's going to be a nice backlog of clay to really get that ceramic going. Unfortunately, since we have so many broken docks, we're having to resort to an ad hoc solution. We've created another rock crusher here and are using it to grind up miscellaneous things. At this point, gold amalgam to gold. We're then having that extra sand being loaded into this conveyor loader, which is going to dump the sand directly onto the system. Once we create enough sand, it'll sort of restart the system by loading up all those deodorizers and then we'll finally be producing more regular oxygen and not polluted oxygen and with that automation wire destroyed it looks like we're finally getting rid of a lot of that clay that could have also contributed to the shortage in fact now that i'm thinking about it considering how much clay is in each of these piles that may have exactly been it basically the deodorizers were creating clay which is then ultimately converted into sand for all of the deodorizers except these deodorizers weren't giving back to the system. Compound that with our 50-50 split of sand and that could have been exactly what was the cause. That's not the only problem. Old Jack here on Ariel was starting to have some oxygen issues. Frankly, because we've been so busy trying to get rid of all the problems on our home colony, we haven't been able to set up the interplanetary launchers for us to be able to set the systems up over on Ariel. So what we've done is dug all the way down here and released a whole lot of polluted oxygen. And so that polluted oxygen is slowly making its way all the way up here. And as more polluted ice melts, it'll create more polluted water, which will then off-gas into more polluted oxygen. 
so I think we're okay for quite some time. Over on Frostine, we were also having our typical end of the dormancy period issues from this cool sus geyser, but in this case, we have a fix. What would happen is all the polluted water that used to be being generated from this bathroom system would then head off to our home planetoid to be used in the arbitraries. And it works just fine as long as you have some water in this tank being provided by the cool slush geyser. Well, what eventually ends up happening is all the water would be used, the polluted water would head off to the home planetoid, and there'd be no fresh water to replace it with. So what we've done is put a bridge on the outflow of the bathroom that sends it right back to this water sieve. Additionally, because the water is prioritized going to the bathrooms, before heading off to the electrolyzer, we'll now always have water in the bathroom. Because no matter if that cool sus geyser never produces any more polluted water, the polluted water is always going to come back through, be cleansed by this water sieve, and then sent into the bathrooms first. And you may think it doesn't make sense to be sacrificing oxygen for that, but with only four dupes on this planetoid, and it all being open to the environment, we sort of have a huge stockpile of oxygen that lasts through the dormancy period of the cool sus geyser. In other updates, the Sleetweed Farm and the Bristle Balsam Farm are working wonderfully. We've put the microbe musher right here on this planetoid and already have 240,000 calories worth of berry sludge. In fact, in the coming cycles, we may get rid of the pip farm altogether. We don't really need the trees over here. We don't need the omelets that the pips are supplying, which means we don't need to be wasting power on things like the electric grill or the refrigerator for that matter, because that berry sludge never spoils. I am going to be double checking everything though, because you know how Ani is. You change one little thing, and your house of cards just falls apart. And after a quick look, I realize, yes, we still are going to need these pips. And that's because they're supplying all the dirt for this sleet wheat. Each pip is providing us 20 kilos worth of dirt per cycle. At 8 pips, that's 160 kilos. And with sleet wheat requiring 5 kilos per cycle, that means we could support 32 sleet wheats. At least from the dirt's perspective. And in this case, we only have 26. The sleet wheat also need 20 kilos worth of water per cycle. Well, times 26 sleet wheat, that gives us a requirement of 520 kilos of water per cycle, or 0.86 kilos per second. When we add it to the requirement of 20 kilos per second for the bristle blossoms, that gives us another 540 kilos required per second, which gives us a total water requirement for both the bristle blossoms and the sleet wheat of 1.76 kilos per second. Well, this bad mamma jamma produces almost three kilos per second. So we're doing plenty fine on that front too. Did I just say bad mamma jamma? Yes, I did. So I guess other than the dumpster fire on Eugenia, at least we have our space food all taken care of. And while we'll continuously need the pips and their dirt, we don't need the omelets that they're providing. And considering barbecue and berry sludge are equal in their morale benefit, the four dupes on this colony could just eat berry sludge and be fine. But I suppose if they're backfilling that supply with omelets and barbecue, it'll leave more berry sludge for our space missions. So we'll leave everything sort of status quo for now. Of course, with berry sludge and barbecue hanging around, they're never actually going to eat these omelets. So we might as well not even cook them. Which means we're going to need to set up some automation to get all those eggs to drop off over here or into another evolution chamber. That way it turns it into barbecue only. All right, that's a little better. We now have all of the eggs and the dirt being loaded up and thrown in this conveyor loader. In fact, we can also grab all the egg shells. And from there, they're put onto this rail, which goes through this solid filter. If it's dirt, it jumps onto the dirt line, which eventually heads up to the sleet wheat farm. Anything else, such as the critter eggs, goes into this evolution chamber here. The last little change we have to make is in order for this auto super to be able to reach inside here to grab the barbecue, it's got to be placed right here, which means we're just going to put this electric grill right about here. One little bug I've found so far in the new patch is you can see this conductive wire looks like it's needing to be put right here. But you'll notice there's no conductive wire there to replace and I can't cancel it either. Not a big deal. Just something to keep an eye out for. As for our new electric grill, the only thing it's making is barbecue. Over on our home planetoid, we're catching back up. You can see there's still a little bit of polluted oxygen every once in a while, but it's a lot better than what it was. 
We've gotten most of the AtmoSuit docks fixed, and will continue to do so until all of that polluted auction runs its course. But now on for the real story of today's episode, and that's our new friends, the Plug Slugs. That's right, folks. One of the best things about the new update, in my opinion, are the changes to the Plug Slugs. Plug Slugs used to only eat ores, and from 60 kilos a cycle, they would create three kilos of hydrogen. But now, they also can eat refined metal. The conversion rate is the same, but the difference is we have plenty of renewable sources of refined metal. And just this one cobalt volcano, for instance, with an average output of 313 grams per second, it produces on average 187 kilos per cycle, which means that one volcano can support three plug slugs sustainably. But we don't just have one cobalt volcano. Here's a second, and here's a third. That gives us, just from cobalt, enough to support nine plug slugs. Additionally, we have a copper volcano that could support another three plug slugs. And then we have two gold volcanoes that can sustain another six plug slugs. So all in all, we could actually feed 18 plug slugs forever producing us all that hydrogen and all the power they produce when they're plugged in forever. I don't think we quite need 18 plug slugs though. This is going to be our first attempt at a good plug slug ranch. We're making it a vertical ranch because we want to manipulate that release of hydrogen. And there's an important reason why. If you allow the plug slugs to sit in their own hydrogen, they will eventually start producing nothing but smog slugs. Not a huge deal at first, except smog plugs consume 50% of the materials, and because of that, they only release 50% of the hydrogen. We don't want that, and as long as our plug slugs are living in an oxygen environment, they'll be much better off. So we're going to start with a gas pump up here. We'll put some sort of filtration system that if it's oxygen it's consuming, to dump it, otherwise send that hydrogen somewhere else. You may have taken a notice at this situation here and thought liquid lock. And that would be one way to make sure that none of the hydrogen escapes whenever the plug slugs release it. The issue with that is you'd need to have suits or some other mechanism to where the dupes aren't getting sopping wet every time they come through. And that's what this is here for. We're not putting any liquid in here. In fact, it's only going to be gases. This existing oxygen line is going to supply oxygen for this area. And because it's a normal gas vent, it's only going to do it until there's about 1800 or 2 kilos worth of environment. Otherwise, it's going to stop producing. So what this is most likely going to be filled with is carbon dioxide. And because of these two interacting gases, the hydrogen's not going to be able to break through both of them and will instead have plenty of time to float up until it gets absorbed by this gas pump. This is at least the theory. Note that we put the gas vent here and not here. If you put it here, you'd then start running into issues with that oxygen overriding the carbon dioxide, which would allow it to continuously release oxygen no matter what the gas pressure around here was. Then you'd start dealing with popped eardrums, and quite frankly, drawing too much oxygen off this line. Which, by the way, is finally back to normal. We still don't have a backlog of sand yet, but you can see a lot more of the deodorizers are working, and the polluted oxygen's not making it all the way up to the gas pumps. And the more the system runs, the more sand it's going to create, further preventing this issue from happening again. Well, as long as we don't make any more wrong turns with our shipping. While the dupes are working on that, I figured I'd show you another couple of updates from around the colony. You'll notice... As Eilert is grooming this pip, all the other pips that need to be groomed are getting in line. How amazingly adorable is that? In fact, because of the queuing system, the duplicates have been able to groom these slicksters a lot faster to the point where normally we'd always see a rancher in these ranches. And now they're able to groom all these critters pretty quickly, freeing up a lot of available labor. I also wanted to talk to you a little bit more about our makeshift Radbolt reactor. Some folks had the idea that you could put a joint plate here, and that way any of the extra rads going through here would fall through here and then dump down into this material study terminal. Well, one of the problems with the Radbolt joint plate is that it interferes with building placement. For instance, I wouldn't be able to put it here because this wheeze wart's in the way. And I can't put it here because this material study terminal is in the way. Additionally, I can't just open this window tile up because if you do, the material study terminal is then not considered to be sitting on a floor, which will then disable the material study terminal, and then we won't have any dupes finishing off that needed research. 
I do plan on doing a retrofit with this after we finish our research and we will utilize some of those joint plates, probably in a configuration something like this that allows us to shoot all those rad bolts down to another reflector, say about here, and that way we'll be able to load up a whole chain of interplanetary launchers. And that system's gonna look something like this. The rad bolts will come out of here, jump into this rad bolt reflector, and then shoot them across all these interplanetary launchers. And when the last interplanetary launcher in it is full, then we'll send an automation signal back here to turn these rad bolt generators off. That way, it'll continuously fire those rad bolts, filling this launcher up first, this launcher up second, and then finally this launcher. For now though, we're still working on some research. All we have left is pressurized forging, cryofuel propulsion, advanced sanitation, and a few more down here by the automation, to include the monuments. These last tier 4 ones take a little while using our current system because they require 370 applied sciences research each. Elsewhere in the solar system, Jack isn't having a good time. You can see they're at 94% stress because they keep peeing themselves. We ran out of dirt again, and our launching system isn't quite done yet. We've also had to remove the insulated tiles from here with the aims of allowing the chill to recool down this whole dig shaft. The reason why we need it open is because we need a targeting beacon up here for all those payloads to come down and then for Jack to be able to pick them up. We're also going to throw down a convenient payload opener right down here, primarily because we have power and it's convenient to Jack's living area. The other problem we're having with Jack is I had to put him back in this suit. Now this suit has been messed in many times. The reason why we had to put Jack back in the suit is because I needed him to be able to get up here to be able to put in the targeting beacon. Unfortunately, you can see it's a little toasty. Upwards 300, almost 400 degrees in some spots. Once this all cools off, we'll be able to take him back out of his suit. Until then, unfortunately, he's just going to have to keep peeing in it. Which makes me wonder, how much pee could one Atmo suit actually hold? Besides that point, though, it is causing him plus 40% stress per cycle. Lucky for us, though, Jack's only an ugly crier. So yeah, they're going to put water everywhere, but hey, that's water we can use later. Sorry, Jack. They also have to keep stopping and taking deep breaths because they're sitting inside their Atmo suit that doesn't have any oxygen. Sorry, Jack. It'll get better soon. Never let go. We're almost ready to drop off some plug slugs here. Last thing we're waiting on is a conveyor receptacle. Because why not add more rails to this system? That rail is being supplied from three different locations, starting with this one here. When gold and cobalt finish going through the debris chiller, they follow this line here, where eventually they go through a solid filter to make sure it's not oxalite. If it is oxalite, it gets dumped into the water tank. Anything else, in other words our refined metal, continue traveling up, where they used to just split off into our infinite storage here. But now, they'll continue on all the way over here to our conveyor receptacle. Until all those refined metals are backed up to this point, and then there's an overflow rail that bypasses this, and then we'll continue on to the infinite storage. Likewise, the same thing happens to the metal coming out of this debris chiller. It takes a long path all the way across the base where it eventually gets picked up into the same line. As you can see here, some cobalt's traveling it right now. And then we also integrated the cobalt volcano inside of this geothermal power plant, whereas it used to be being dropped off right here. We've just continued the rail to join up. Although it looks like it needs some navigational help, doesn't it? Easy enough. Adding a bridge and deconstructing that rail right there. Nope, that didn't do the trick either. And I do this all the time. You'll notice the refined metal still doesn't know which way to go because there's an input here and there's an input here, which is serving as our overflow, which is where the metal comes from when the shutoff is triggered. Fixing this should be easy enough. We'll just add another bridge right here. And as luck would have it, we've caught all the pips queuing up in their cute little line except none of them are trying to get groomed by Lady Ruff. Remember, the update did just come out today, so this process might still be a little buggy, as Lady Ruff's been sitting here for about a half cycle trying to get a critter to come. In fact, you'll notice all the critters are glum. Oh, this could be bad. I better restart. All right, a quick restart did the trick. Now all the pips are waiting in line correctly again, and they're being groomed. After looking at it, it looks like only one critter is supposed to be in line at a time. So something was happening because all of the critters were in that tile and none of them were jumping up on the grooming station. Just something to keep an eye out for. That bridge is now installed and everything is working hunky-dory. And yes, I said hunky-dory. 
And I'm going to take the opportunity to follow the metal all the way across the rails just to make sure everything is working correctly. And nope, it wasn't. Some Travis somewhere flipped this bridge. Wasn't me. These dupes are really lucky to have a printing pod like me to be able to fix these sort of mistakes. <laughs> With that bridge flipped the correct way, the refined metal is heading over to the stable as intended. We'll go over to Critter Feeder and we have plenty of options for our plug slugs now. Cobalt, Copper, and Gold. We have it set on priority one because we don't want duplicates bringing metals here. We want the auto sweepers loading it in automatically from the conveyor receptacle. But it looks like Lady Ruff was bored and did it anyways. Now all that's left is transferring a few of these beautiful slug plugs and see how our new system works. We can also deconstruct everything in here because we will no longer be using this system, which reminds me of another tip. If you haven't stopped for a little while in your colony, smell the fresh air per se, it's good to take a look and see what systems you're no longer using and reclaiming all of these wonderful materials. Also, as a reminder, the less systems and piping in your colony, the less the simulation has to calculate, which makes the game run that much better. And then when you're all done, Make sure you tidy up, because that also helps the simulation. The plug slugs are in place, and they're providing some pretty good power at 400 watts apiece. But I have a feeling that number is going to increase a lot as soon as they're not wild. And the great thing is the plug slugs produce that power at night, when your solar panels aren't producing any. On top of that, we're filtering out the hydrogen and bringing it all the way down here to a little mini hydrogen plant. Now it's not gonna have to run very often, and we may put in a system that it only turns on once the hydrogen's backed up so far. Okay, what's the problem here? Plenty of power on our line, plenty on the system itself, yet this special large power transformer doesn't seem to be holding any charge. In fact, every other battery in the colony is working perfectly, and no other transformer in the colony is short power either. It says there's no power wire connected. All right, let me try reloading again. By the way, the current reload time for this one colony is about three to four minutes. And the power transformer is working fine now. And these constant sort of bugs that I'm dealing with aren't necessarily because we're 1200 cycles in. We've brought many colonies this far into the game. Rather, I think it might be because of all the systems we have, specifically all the integrated rail systems. I've never had a colony with this many auto sweepers, conveyor receptacles, conveyor loaders, and this planetoid is stacked with them. We are also running a fair bit amount of critters as well. We have all these slicksters, lots of pips here, lots of pips here, sage hatches over here, a bunch of wild puffs that we've let just continue to grow, and now the beautiful plug slugs. Not to mention the critters and systems we're running over on Frostaline. It might also be the amount of plants we have as well. We've done more of that in this series too. Everything from the sleet wheat, the bristle blossoms, some trees over here, and a stupid amount of trees on this planetoid between the wild farm and the domesticated. So I'm going to spend some hours in the off time trying to clean these places up to maximize some of the performance trying to minimize some of the bugs and weird interruptions that we keep getting in the colony. But if I don't have success, that might spell a premature disaster for this run. And I don't want that to happen. By the way, that's now 3,200 watts being supplied by two plug slugs. I can't wait to see what eight will do besides causing more bugs in the simulation. But on the good news front, this stable looks like it's a success. Unfortunately, in this specific design, we'd only have enough room for seven hanging plug slugs because I don't think they'd hang right in front of this gas element sensor, but hey, let's try it out anyways. We explained the gas pump system and the gas filter. We have this gas element firing whenever it sees hydrogen. It tells the gas pump to turn on and start siphoning out all of that hydrogen. That way these slug plugs don't ever get an increased chance to lay any smog slug eggs. Just as a point of reference, these two plug slugs produce more power than eight solar panels. In fact, when this ranch is full, we're going to be producing more than 12,000 watts. That's as much as six petroleum generators. Absolutely incredible. As a final closing note, don't worry about Jack. He's going to be just fine. We've just launched our first interplanetary payload. Starts right here at our makeshift Radbolt reactor. This Radbolt generator fires Radbolts into this joint plate, which shoots it down and then across. We have a simple system here. Whatever we want to send over, we just put inside this conveyor loader. And when it gets enough Radbolts and at least 200 kilos worth of 
in this case dirt, it fires them off nicely. In fact, Jack's shipment is almost here. And while Jack's not very happy about it, we did need to make him a mechatronics engineer, which brings his morale requirement up over 15. Don't worry, we'll skill scrub him soon. The reason we have to do that was just temporarily to install the conveyor chute and a couple of rails to the payload opener. Now we could have just manually opened every single payload as it comes, but we have several colonies we're taking care of and I can't wait for payloads to come in to click empty storage for Jack to know to go get him. This way, whenever a payload lands, Jack's gonna wanna go grab it whenever he's not having a good cry and throw it on the payload opener. Don't worry, Jack. I'll make room for you on the door. With that first can dropped off, now all I have to do is click empty storage. Jack will come by and grab it, empty it, and then have access to dirt. But when we finish the conveyor chute, I won't even have to click empty storage. And look at this. Jack has some dirt. Now that Jack has a place to go to the bathroom, we have to empty the suit. So we're gonna move him right over here, unequip the suit, and all the polluted water comes out. Last couple updates is we're down to our final two pieces of research, and instead of having a third interplanetary launcher, I figured we'd put in a diamond press. The diamond press is a great last stop for your rad bolts because it can store 2,000 rad bolts, and it takes 1,000 rad bolts to make 100 kilos worth of diamond. So it's very unlikely this diamond press is ever going to fill up, at least at the rate that we produce the rad bolts. We will be producing them a lot quicker once we're done with the research, and we can point all three of these rad bolt generators towards the interplanetary launchers and the diamond press. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I really do hope this colony keeps on chugging along. I can't wait to see our slug plug reactor really start thriving. The colony's never been happier with the power supplies that those plug slugs are giving. I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say, and I'll talk to you soon.